a uh, good morning all a uh, welcome to this session of our summer program on additive manufacturing uh for manufacturing and uh infrastructure sectors uh so today uh, we have very eminent speaker with us uh, dr vc shrivastav he is a senior principal scientist at uh, csir national metallurgical laboratory jamshedpur so i believe uh, maybe some of the participants familiar with the csir laboratories uh so there are uh, the labs are distributed throughout the country so nml is one of them then like npl at delhi uh, then there are many more uh, in in different different areas uh so professor uh, dr shrivastav uh he is also a dad fellowship awardee so that is a prestigious fellowship Uh, given by germany uh, he received young metallurgist of the year award from ministry of steels government of india avh research fellowship from germany and avh reinvitation fellowships uh, he has done his phd in physical metallurgy from iit bhu varanasi mtech also materials technology from same organization btech in mechanical engineering from kamla nehru institute of technology sultanpur his field of work is materials processing alloy development heat treatment spray forming and melt atomization as we have heard in uh, some of the lectures uh, like by rani shaw that uh, the metal powders which are used as raw materials for metal 3d printing they are preferably made by the melt atomization process and then uh, final work area is metallic forms uh, so he have he has published a number of uh, referred journal papers proceedings he is also holding patents and book chapters as well uh, he has supervised phd thesis and several mtech thesis this is and given a number of national and international lectures uh i welcome uh, dr shrivastav and i extend a uh, warm welcome and also thanks for uh, sparing time to deliver a talk for the benefit of uh, the students and uh, faculty member participants of this program thank you sir now i welcome you please uh, take over thank you dr sharma <clears throat> a very good morning to all of uh, the attendees uh, at the outset i thank uh, dr sharma for inviting me to deliver this talk online and unfortunately my uh, internet in my lab uh, went off to the morning so i had to manage with my mobile so if there is there is something wrong happening please forgive me but uh, let us uh, uh, keep our fingers crossed so that uh, everything goes well <clears throat> so today i will be talking on uh, product development and metallurgical issues in additive manufacturing so product development you know uh, how we have to go for uh, if we want to develop a new product or we have to make some changes in the product so there will be some uh, uh talk uh, <coughs> some talks on this and uh in metal additive manufacturing there are always some metallurgical issues which we have to uh keep in mind when we work with additive manufacturing particularly metals and alloys before going in detail first of all let us see uh, this uh, slide are you able to see this slide Yes, yes, sir. It is visible. Yeah, yeah. In the next slide here we have a black black smith and one clay potter pottery. So what happens in age-old times? Uh, 
Black Smithy was known to people, and clay pottery also uh, was known to people. But uh, do we know that whether they knew the science behind it? So they knew the technique, they distributed technique to make sickles, make us in pots, us in uh, lamps, but they were not able to see, uh, understand the science behind, behind it. So they discovered, they might have dis discovered with experience or by chance, and they started using it. But the era we are living in is basically the age of science where we go into the material, into the processes and know what kind of uh, uh, processes give value to what kind of uh, microstructure or properties of the material. Based on that, we try to develop products for uh, the benefit of the mankind. So in this process, <coughs> in this process, what happened? There was the yes, moment. There was the first uh, industrial revolution, revolution in the year around 1780s, where uh, what uh, happened is the way we were using only the uh, <coughs> manual labor or manual energy to do something that was uh, given to the steam engines and other processes. And later on, we shifted to second industrial revolution. I think mobile is slow, so yes, moment. Yeah. Second industrial revolution where a little bit of automation was put in in the material. And you can see that this happened in the. Okay. Then after, there was a third revolution, industrial revolution where full automation took place and the production rate of the products increased. That is the third uh, industrial revolution in 1970. Today, in, uh, in the first uh, 21st century, in the beginning itself, we witnessed a fourth industrial revolution, what we know actually as Industry 4. And uh, this industrial, uh, fourth industrial revolution uh, used the physical system as well as, as the cyber system to uh, bring in the large amount of flexibility with the production part. But what happened, if you look at very carefully, then these processes which are coming up now and those processes which were being uh, practiced by many other people, other industries, there is a lot of difference. Difference in economics, difference in the uh, supply chain, and different in the market. So what happened? This new development in the industry was uh, uh, in post industrial revolution. Revolution. Uh, there is bound to be a technological disruption as well as uh, market trauma. Uh, I would uh, I would request you all to please mute your. Uh, Microphone, please. Please mute your microphone, please. Yeah. So we have to be very careful with these new developments in the industry, in the technology, technology, and the science behind it. Now, if you look at uh, the new developments, uh, starting from 15th century to the 21st century, we had witnessed several major technological advancements, right from the printing press in 15th century, to electricity, medicine, telephone, computers, internet, and we have, we have after crossing all these uh, advancements, reached to 21st century where 3D printing has been proved to be one of the most promising processes to uh, to, the, to make uh, the products which are really not possible by any other uh, processing techniques. Now we should know what is additive manufacturing actually. So what is additive manufacturing? So simple definition gives process of joining materials to make objects 
from 3D model data and usually layer upon layer. So if you look at uh, two different processes, uh, <coughs> what we had been doing uh, today up to now was two manufacturing processes, that is formative manufacturing and subtractive manufacturing. In formative manufacturing, you know, uh, being a student, a student of mechanical engineering, that casting is called formative manufacturing, where you have a dye, then you pour a milk uh, in the material, and when it solidifies, then you take the material out. You can see this, this, uh, this picture. Yeah, you are taking the This is formative manufacturing. Then there is a subtractive manufacturing, where you take blocks and then use your uh, machining tool and give a shape to the material so that you reach to the desired, uh, desired product. But in additive manufacturing, this is totally different. You do not use a liquid uh, or dye or something, or you do not in, uh, use any uh, machine tool, but you just use a raw material in liquid form or solid form in the form of powders or sheets or uh, uh, powder seeds and wires, where you can see that you build the product layer by layer. You start from uh, depositing layer, layers and you build up and finally come to the product. So this is called additive manufacturing. So you can understand that right now, formative and subtractive manufacturing is taking a backstage and the additive manufacturing is becoming easier to operate for the people. And the most important thing is you can make very complex uh, products using this technique because you do not have to depend upon dye making or the tool movement. Okay. Uh, see, uh, a, sculpt, uh, a sculpture puzzle. Here you can see Uh, Dr. Sharma. Yes, sir. Uh, am I uh, audible? Yes, sir, you are. Yeah, yeah. The okay. screen is also. Okay, okay. I, I just wanted to check in between. <laughs> okay. So, you, if you look at this, this is. Uh, that's fine, sir. That's all right. Okay. This is, this is the, these are the puzzles where you can uh, just imagine you have a model like this and you want to make uh, this model using different layers as you are doing in additive manufacturing. So what you do, you divide this whole model in different layers and you put on different layers according to a requirement to build this whole body. So this is what happens in a additive manufacturing process. You take your, the product uh, but in a computer, you divide in different layers and your computer knows what different layers, shape and thickness are. And using the tool, the additive manufacturing machine, you uh, develop those layers one by one over each and uh, every level of the material and finally you get the material. Now, what do you require in additive manufacturing? So there are four main things. That is control, where you have to have a CAD file, that you can make CAD file by your own design, uh, CAD design, or you can uh, take any product, do reverse engineering, and come out with a CAD model. Then you can divide it in different layers and think of what parameters uh, you, can, you should use so that you are successfully able to make a product. And what are the inputs in this? You have to have uh, raw materials, for example, powders, or wires, or liquid, or a liquid in case of polymers only, liquid or wires. Okay. And there are other utilities you uh, you understand. And there is a substrate. On the substrate, you start building the material, building, building the product. Then there is the AM machine here, and this AM machine. Uh, builds it for you and finally 
you get a block block or product you can say or uh, uh, the substrate will substrate will always be there and then there will be exhaust gases because you do additive manufacturing in a, 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 in a, a closed chamber where it, it is filled with gases and obviously some powders or sheets will not be used in additive manufacturing, manufacturing process and so this will be treated as waste so here you can uh, look at in the next slide that you require a digital model of the product and you require materials this is liquid droplet wire sheet or powder and uh, uh, you require tool for laying material that is uh, am machine and a digital control system for the tool that is sensors 3d movement of the uh, uh, nozzle and all those things, all, all the laser beam, all those things are necessary. Uh, these four things are necessary to have a successful additive manufacturing, uh, to, pro to produce additively manufactured product. Uh, if you look at the uh, <coughs> evolution of additive manufacturing, uh, that is called 3D printing also, then uh, it started basically in 1984, and there was uh, different developments at different stages. In 1994, it was the first uh, process by uh, polymerization of uh, liquid polymer, and uh, that uh, that gave a feeling that how a 3D uh, 3D model can be produced using a liquid polymer uh, by photopolymerization, and finally. We got the printing machine. Uh, printing machines uh, in the market in the year around 2008 or before that. And then uh, we started manufacturing products in 2014 onwards. This is the evolution of 3D printing. And uh, what is uh, what it looks like, how it takes place. So just to give a, a feel of this, uh, I am taking four different uh, processes for liquid, powder, wire, and sheet. And uh, uh, you can see that uh, here, <coughs> a liquid precursor is there in a beaker. And uh, just a moment, that is in, uh, in a beaker. And now your computer knows what should be the first layer of the product. And there is this, uh, there is a photo uh, UV, UV laser light. And as it falls on the polymer, polymer is cured and becomes solid. The moment it becomes solid, it, it is brought down and new liquid comes up. And on, the sec uh, on that, a second layer is uh, cured. So if it keeps on happening, finally, in the, uh, after so many different layers are uh, cured, you get the final product. This is if you have a liquid precursor. Now, if you have a powder precursor, then what do you do? Here, this is a substrate. You, you put in one layer of powder here, like that, and then you use layer, uh, laser light, and this laser solidifies the first layer of your product here. And once this is solidified, then you put a second layer of powder on this, and then once you put the second layer, uh, then the second layer known by the computer will be printed on the first layer. So that way you will be able to, uh, to produce in so many different layers, if you have thousands or 2000 layers of material uh, you put and then you get the product. It depends on the size of the product you want. Okay, now if you have wire precursor, just an example for in, uh, the case of uh, polymers. Uh, here also you have a wire, uh, sorry. You have a wire here, and this is being extruded through a nozzle. This is a nozzle, this is generally heated, and when this wire passes through this uh, uh, nozzle, it is it becomes almost liquidous, liquid, and then you start building layer by layer like this, as you, you, we had been doing earlier. So layer by layer using a uh, wire precursor uh, which is extruded up, uh, and heated and extruded and then you get the product. Here are some uh, 
small lines you can see here and here. These are basically the supports. Because if if you have you want to develop this uh, part like this or this part, and then you need a support to make them stable, your product is stable. These uh, supports are very uh, small and very thin in uh, in size. They, once you make the product, then you can just take them out or break them out. Okay. Then uh, sheet metal precursor, if you have, so you have a coil of uh, sheet here, and this coil passes through a heater, a heated coil, and once it is heated, here you use a laser and cut different layer. This is the first layer of a product, then second layer. So you keep on uh, cutting the, those layers from this whole uh, sheet and laying one by one. And this requires proper centering and proper joining so that you get the final 3D product after sheet precursor, using sheet precursor. Okay. There is one more important uh, uh, <coughs> process. Yeah. This is uh, important process that is called uh, binder jetting, where you don't use any laser system or uh, any extrusion. What you do is uh, you take the powder, just here only, layer by layer, you are putting in, and what you do is you use one binder here. This binder is coming and layer by layer, it is just binding the powders. Uh, this binding uh, can be done for metals, ceramics, as well as polymers. And once this is made, this product is made, this is not the final product, this is a green product basically because it will not have a strength. So this, uh, this part has to be centered in a given environment so that you can get the desired part in the sintered form. Uh, from this to uh, the sintered process, there is a little bit of dimensional changes, so you have to keep a, a care of those dimensional changes which may take place after sintering. So you have to give uh, a tolerance in your product design before you uh, start uh, using binder jetting. Okay. So here is just uh, an example of uh, what is the difference between subtractive manufacturing and additive manufacturing. So just uh, think of that you want to produce some uh, bolts. So for bolts here you require uh, some wire. We call it wire rod basically here. So wire rod, then you will do some cold forging. Then you form the bolt head, then you start threading it. You can thread it by rolling or cutting. And after that, you make you do heat treatment to give the strength to the bolt, and finally the surface treatment. So so many different uh, processes are involved in making a bolt. Uh, though the production rate is very high, but uh, you can uh, you have to have so many processes. Uh, but in additive manufacturing. You need to have a design of the product on a computer. You should have a printing machine and you can directly print a product. The properties of these products uh, may not be as good as you want as you get in subtractive manufacturing, but they require some post processing to be done on these products which are additively manufactured. In some cases, it is very, uh, it, you can use it just after the surface finish, but in some cases where uh, you want it to be load bearing, you have to do some post processing of the material. Now, after this, uh, we can summarize the whole process uh, of additive manufacturing as, uh, as follows. So, if you have a part here and you want to make this part using Additive manufacturing. So, what do you do? First of all, uh, you make a CAD design, you make a CAD uh, translator, translate the CAD design. So, finally, you make a CAD model of the product. And after that, uh, you make the file suited for 
the uh, additive manufacturing machine to verify your file so that whatever uh, you have designed it is is it exactly coming as a, uh, in the product or not or uh, what kind of support you require to make that part and what parameters the process parameters of the machine you should use to get the desired uh, shape of the product after that uh, you have to ensure uh, the material, what material you are using, uh, the chemical composition should be the same, what you want, as well as the physical properties should be known a priori of the, uh, before you go to uh, additive manufacturing process. Then you make the build. Yeah, then you go to uh, additive manufacturing machine and you start building the product layer by layer. And finally, once you are done with the product manufacturing, then you, you have to do post-processing as I just told you in the, big, uh, in the last slide. And in some cases, post-processing may be required where you have to clean it, you have to remove the support, uh, uh, support elements, or you may need to go for some heat treatment, some curing processes like uh, in uh, binder jetting and other processes. Uh, I think uh, up to now I am clear. And now we go to different processes what we have uh, in the market. So there are different processes. The first of all is uh, uh, direct energy deposition uh, process where uh, you try, you give a laser or electron beam, uh, electron beam, uh, beam which uh, has a focus thermal energy and this thermal energy, uh, where there is a, a laser, then you put powder in this, and powder is melted, and fused material is deposited layer by layer. Uh, then you have powder bed fusion process, as I just uh, showed in the uh, powder process uh, pictorially. That is powder bed fusion means you create a bed of powder. Now the first uh, bed of uh, bed of powder uh, powder. Then you uh, use laser and make the first layer of the product. Then you put the second bed of the uh, powder and then make the second layer like that. Then the binder jetting, I just explained to you that this requires a, a liquid bonding agent and liquid bond, bonding is used layer by layer uh, on the, uh, on the uh, powder layer. Then the material extrusion. Where uh, in this case, just for the, the, the ceramics or uh, polymers, you can use it and in this uh, process and materially selectively di uh, dismissed to a nozzle or orifice. As I showed it to you uh, in the uh, slide, uh, describe the wire process. Uh, then material jetting here, <coughs> in this case, uh, you make the uh, droplets of material like uh, in case of polymers this uh, happens and the droplets are selectively put on the uh, uh, <coughs> selectively deposited and here do you don't require a powder you just require droplets uh, putting on the first layer and then once that is cured then you put the second layer of droplets so here you don't require uh, putting a bed of powders but simply droplets one upon other, they can develop into a product. Uh, then sheet metal lamination, that uh, I have already described it to you. Uh, then wet polymerization, that also I described to you in the liquid process, where you have a photo liquid photopolymer, and liquid photopolymer is cured using light activated photo photopolymerization. Uh, so the next uh, thing is, <clears throat> uh, what kind of, uh, just to uh, uh, revisit these processes and the, uh, what happens, how they can be used, what material you can use. Uh, so <clears throat> raw materials and processes, uh, finished stock in material, what you can have is liquid or solid. And what uh, forms of this finished stock can be, so they can be powder, they can be filament, they can be sheet, and uh, 
uh, liquid doesn't have any form so liquid will always be there and then uh, what are the principles uh, in all these different uh, processes so in a liquid you uh, can have polymerization and also you can use binder like that okay uh, but for powder you can use uh, binder jetting or you can use melting and freezing just like when you use laser then you actually melt the, melt the powder and that is solidified but in the in the same powder you can put binders here and binders will give a binding material to the 3d product but it will not give you strength so after this you will have to go for uh, sintering or curing and uh, this is mostly used in all the ceramic as well as the metal then filament again uh, uh, melting and freezing is required the same uh, process can be used same principle can be used for this and sheet there is no other uh, joining process only joining from surface to surface so these are the processes now what are the am processes we call these the am processes are uh, uh, the wet polym polymerization for uh, liquid and binder jetting and material jetting uh, after you use binder in the uh, with the powders then you can use these two processes and melting and freezing there are two different uh, three different processes uh, that is powder bed uh, <coughs> and uh, directed energy deposition and material extrusion but uh, for the sheet it's the sheet lamination that is the uh, whole uh, am processes that can be used uh, for liquid as well as solid and this picture shows that which process is good for which material so here you can see uh, in the first left dark green process here like this so that means polymers are basically mostly done by wet polymer polymerization and binder jetting and uh, in the liquid form basically and if you have polymers in the form of uh, powder then you do binder jetting or uh, material jetting and here these three different colors they show that darkest is more suitable and as the it becomes lighter the suitability of this process decreases okay same here is powder bed and uh, ded this cannot be used for polymers but ceramic and metals are frequently uh, using this these techniques and uh, you can see metals are more preferable compared to ceramic for these two techniques similarly for uh, material extrusion and uh, this uh, for metals basically sheet uh, lamination is used but for polymers and ceramic ceramics are not generally used in material extrusion or sheet lamination but polymers can be used so this is uh, giving a very good uh, whole picture of what happens and what are the processes raw materials and uh, am principles all those things. so now we come to some products what products are uh, uh, made by uh, these uh, techniques so applications uh, you can go for prototyping you can go for low volume manufacturing you can make tools uh, consumer products and you can make some products you customize to your own needs even at your home you can uh, make some products according to what shape and size you want because it, if it is not standard and it is not being produced in the market then you can yourself personalize such products for yourself uh, you can make art and designs uh, like uh, this uh, and you can use this process for educating students now you know that there is the government of india is still developing uh, they are using atal tinkering lab where they have this kind of uh, uh, 3d printing lab and they are teaching the students about uh, 3d printing in schools and you can use this in medical in uh, medical uh, 
uh, industry where you can make fruit, you can make uh, orthopedic parts, and also you can make uh, the skill parts. So there are some people. Just for example, if uh, uh, somebody had an uh, had an accident and some fracture goes on in the head, so immediately the doctors that they do a CT scan, they find which part is fractured, and they can immediately print that part and fit in. So these are the applications uh, of uh, 3D printing, and uh, <clears throat> so you can see these are the products from ceramic, from plastic and from metals. I don't want to go in detail of this. Uh, for metals in particular, uh, many of the uh, materials are being used for engineering application. For example, you see this is the hydraulic wall by, uh, made by stainless steel. This is titanium heat joint, titanium alloy heat, uh, heat joint. And uh, uh, this is a heat exchanger made of copper. Uh, this is induction heating coil by copper. So many of the uh, these alloys and materials are being used to make engineering products. And in in the uh, we can say that if you have metal AM uh, AM, then what are the advantages? So first of all, there is freedom of design. <coughs> Means uh, <coughs> you can sit on the computer. You can design whatever you want according to your need, or if you like some product and you want to copy it, you can go for CD scan, you can bring it in the computer and just try to print. So, the print out and uh, the complexity for free. If you use uh, formative, sub, uh, formative manufacturing or subjective manufacturing, you are limited with the uh, processes. Some uh, intricate shape you simply cannot make. It's just impossible to make by conventional uh, processes. But in this uh, uh, additive manufacturing process, you have that flexibility that you can make any complex uh, um, part. And that also gives you uh, an advantage because you know we use different fasteners. Uh, uh, in the in the industry to bring in uh, some new uh, mechanism, but what happens? These fasteners add to the uh, uh, to the weight of the material to the uh, product, and also uh, these partner fasteners add to the uh, number of the uh, components. Okay, so to avoid these fasteners, what you can do is you can simply uh, bring all these things together and design it and you can have one single product where you don't require any fastness at all. So this is the uh, one thing, this is the other thing, just here you see uh, this is part consolidation. You have so many different, uh, you can make uh, different parts of this pipe, for example, and then you have to fasten it. But if you use uh, additive manufacturing, you can make this shape in one go like this. So you avoid the partial. Similarly, <clears throat> you can do make lightweight design. What do you mean by light? Uh, I mean by lightweight design is in some cases, what happens uh, that if you have a solid product and you, if you have to use it and you want the dimension to be bigger, like uh, metal foam. Metallic forms are light and uh, they have a different uh, application. But uh, if you want to make a metallic foam kind of thing, all the materials with uh, minus uh, poison ratio, that also you can make by this process. <coughs> uh, then uh, uh, AM can be used for many other processes. For example, you, you want to make the dyes with the uh, internal pulling, then what you do? Uh, you have to make uh, so different arrangements if you want to make that load dies using uh, conventional load, but in the uh, uh, AM process, you can make channels. Channels like this, you can see here, uh, green channels like this, or here in the green channel here, 
So inside, inside the product, you have channels where you can pass your uh, coolant, and your material will be uh, safe. Your material will have longer life, and all those. Things. For example, forging dies. There you can always do such uh, process. Hmm. And uh, second is uh, additive manufacturing in metal casting, for example. So we know that in metal casting, making pattern and making cores uh, is, uh, is a very difficult uh, task. And uh, in this process, uh, in, uh, generally people use binder making, they use sand as it is, and sand uh, is used for additively uh, manufacturing uh, uh, patterns like this. And these patterns are made in such a way that they are the negative part of something. And then uh, when you make a CAD model, uh, you make negative and then you make positive by uh, during. Uh, so part design in CAD, see the solid model is inverted to make a negative of the part. So you make a part and then invert it, then you get a, a pattern and also the core and that can be used for uh, making a second positive uh, as a product so and this gives a design freedom also for making the uh, patterns and core okay uh, but one thing i would like to mention here is uh, very, uh, which is very important uh, that is when to use uh, additive manufacturing so additive manufacturing uh, should be strictly used only for very complex systems, complex products. Because if it is not complex, then you can use the conventional route of uh, manufacturing. And uh, if you if you use traditional fabrication process, manufacturing process, then the cost increase uh, with the complexity increases like this. If you are making more complex parts, then uh, cost increases like this. But uh, if you are using additive manufacturing in the cost increase like this. So, uh, what is the advantage? If you have more and more complexity and you want to make more and more number of uh, products, then additive manufacturing will be cheaper compared to the traditional process. So, uh, that gives a message to us that we should be taking up additive manufacturing only when the parts become very complex or we want to reduce the weight by combining different parts into one. So I don't want to go in this. So now I come to the metal additive manufacturing. In metal additive manufacturing, there are, as I told you, there are different things. For example, uh, uh, there can be load bearing as well as non load bearing products. So, if you have non load bearing products, for example, uh, the as I showed in the bottom, uh, this is uh, heating coil, industrial heating coil, or uh, heat exchangers, they are non load, non load bearing components. And non load bearing components, uh, what they can do is uh, they can serve the purpose, this, uh, but they cannot withhold uh, any loading on them. But if you want to load the product, then you have to have so many different properties uh, that has to come with that. That is, uh, microstructure and phases you have to control, you have to control the texture, you have to control the mechanical properties, for example, creep resistance, fatigue resistance, strength, ductility, all those things. Okay, so there are two ways. So, uh, what happens that in uh, load bearing components, if you want to uh, concentrate on the mechanical properties, then definitely you have to look at the microstructure uh, very carefully. So, this uh, is process where you uh, design a material or product and you have some equipment and you know how to operate it and then you make material uh, and uh, measure the performance. But what happens, you can go in two ways. 
either you uh, do it by, on your own without knowing any science behind, uh, behind why you are doing something or you can know uh, the performance you require in your product and then you uh, slowly you, by knowing everything what it happen, what happens what is science behind it and then you go to equipment and build the part directly so there are two different ways one is science based methodolo methodology uh, where you know the goals and you know the means that is called inductive inference in inference and uh, then uh, by chance if you produce something that is you have the experience as in the second slide we saw making sickles and uh, earthen uh, lamps so those are the discovery and experience so you know uh, what was what and then finally you get the material for yourself but if you are doing science to that if you want science as performance then what we should do so you should know the goals and means of your uh, uh, your product and then you uh, use your science understanding and then go to the equipment so additive manufacturing metal manufacturing is basically done by two ways one is powder bed process and ded and they look like this uh, in the left side picture in the bottom you are able to see uh, this is one layer being uh, uh, being fused using uh, a laser light uh, laser beam and the second one there is a direct ener energy uh, electron beam or laser beam uh, that there wherever it, uh, it strikes the substrate uh, powders of the material goes there and fused and this is how you get the product but uh, what happens that in the process when you apply the uh, high energy beam on the powder there are different processes, processes happening uh, that is a large amount of heat is coming on the powder and it is melted some elements may evaporate some may uh, radiate and there are different kinds of things happening some powders on the sides of this uh, for example this is melted heat is going through all these processes all these areas and some powders are still uh, unmelted or fused so this is the condition of a liquid pool once you uh, supply uh, energy here on the powder bed so what happens if you have first layer for example this layer here where the material where, where the laser beam strikes it is melted and this area is also heated but the uh, temperature is slowly decreasing as you go away from the point of a strike but as you increase the thickness of the product as you go up layer by layer then the area heated becomes more and more so that means all the part which has already been deposited may be further affected by the heat of the process okay this is one thing and the second part is that once you uh, melt the liquid just to say this is a powder layer and this is a substrate you melt the liquid this is a liquid pool form uh, metal pool forming and as the energy increases this form okay this big liquid pool forms on the surface we call it prior uh, liquid pool this liquid pool here is a substrate and there will be some nucleation here so what i mean this liquid has will solidify will become solid but during solidification there may happen two things two things they are either you have new nucleation of new phases or it may uh, solidify on the previous layers of the solid so there is a competition between uh, nucleation and the growth of all of the existing uh, processes are uh, already existing microstructure or uh, grain you see you can please please, please switch off the please mute the micro, uh, microphone yeah. so here you can see there is a directionality in the microstructure so this directionality basically in the process and 
here you can see that uh, one of my colleague dr gopala krishnan uh, he had done some work on uh, stainless steel and here you can see uh, he uh, printed this block and you can see the micro hatchel the micro hatchel this one it is uh, coming from directly from normal conventional uh, road but these micro hatchels are from different sections of the of the block so never so what happens that different micro hatchels in different direction so they give rise to a kind of a dashnality in the material so this dashnality in the material uh, 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 generally is not good for the mechanical properties or it may rise to give rise to any sort of in the material and this is why uh, metallic components which is load bearing there is a, there there are some issues which has to be dealt with uh, with proper control of the parameters and uh, proper knowledge of the effect of the process parameters on the microstructure so what happens that uh, to address these problems uh, uh, people devise the different ways of uh, using lasers so we call it uh, laser scanning strategy yeah, you can see uh, in in this case layer goes in this way then comes back and here so there are different ways you can use your lasers here you can see last one chess board so if you use this kind of uh, laser processing then what you get you get though you will have anisotropy but this will be very local in region so anisotropy as well as the inhomogeneity in the material due to the thermal stresses or uh, due to compositional variation may be reduced if you use this kind of uh, laser scanning technology uh, the possibility that uh, once you get the uh, different uh, directionality in a material you can always go for post processing like heat treatment and the process to change the process this may not be may not be at all be useful that we have to see that which material we are using and uh, what is the effect of a different uh, heat treatment uh, schedules on this material and whether it is heat treatable or not those things issues are there uh, now i come to uh, the brief uh, on am metallurgical issues uh, what are the processing defects you can see so there can be loss of uh, loss of the elements you know, uh, all the elements which are having low melting point they may evaporate from the bed and finally your composition may be may not be that what you want and there may be some porosity or lack of fusion there may be some gas entrapment in the material during melting or uh, as i showed you earlier some powders may not be fused altogether or <coughs> they may not be properly sintered also in that so if they are uh, not fused so they will be separate and they will be uh, seen in the microstructure in the form of pores okay and uh, then surface roughness surface roughness depend upon the uh, what is the energy you are using for uh, uh, your additive manufacturing or what is the powder size you are using or what is the layer thickness you are uh, giving layer thickness means layer th thickness varies from a very low 20 micron to around 100 micron layer thickness of powder and these things may be determining the, what is the uh, uh, what would be the surface roughness of your product very uh, Two different uh, soil root and uh, different in the material. There and uh, there may also be some in situ phase transformation in the material. So due to phase transformation or the due to thermal stress, there may be the stresses in the uh, product or some thermal uh, or some distortion may take place in the material. So all these things have to be taken care of uh, during. Uh, Uh, during the additive manufacturing process and anyway uh, though we are we say that we have been uh, we are quite advanced in additive manufacturing but uh, it's my personal view that so far as load bearing uh, the products are concerned 
we have not gone very far out. Though people uh, show products with very good uh, mechanical properties, uh, but even then, uh, the literature says we have to go a long way. Then there are solidification defects in the material. Uh, uh, I am not sure you people are uh, uh, the uh, students from mechanical engineering, but uh, I don't know whether the solidification part is there in the curriculum or not. Uh, but there are some anisotropy in the material due to additive manufacturing and uh, solid state phase transformation, and there are some microstructural inhomogeneity. So, all these defects may lead to different uh, kinds of uh, uh, mechanical instability in the material. So, these have to be solved. Uh, now, I come to metal powder. Uh, I have only 10 slides left, five, uh, uh, 8 slides, so I think uh, time is also coming up. So, uh, the thing which I want to mention here is uh, the Indian situation. Metal powder for uh, AM of metallic uh, of uh, metals and alloys are very important. So, right now, whatever uh, powders we used to uh, have in India, that is particularly imported, or there are one or two uh, companies. Uh, GKN is there in Bangalore, they are producing it. But uh, for a widespread uh, use of AM, uh, uh, I personally feel that we should have much more uh, emphasis on powder production within the country. And there is one more thing that all the powders which uh, we are getting right now, they are basically mean for uh, mean for the order metallurgy route, but in uh, AM we get uh, a very high solubility rate, and uh, we can have a different composition altogether suited for AM of the material. So there are two things: uh, in-house uh, powder production in India, as well as we should have lab-scale powder production units where we can play with the composition to produce powders and we can test those powders with a new composition that how these powders are good for AIM. Okay, so here uh, in this uh, uh, next slide, uh, you see what are the characteristics of a feedstock material, that is metal powder. They should be very small in size, uh, they should be very uh, the spherical, they should be loose flowability. Flowability means if you have a mass of powder and if you just tilt the beaker, it should flow very smoothly. And it should have narrow side distribution, means uh, the powder should have the, uh, uh, the uh, powder sizes not in the very wide range, but in a very small size range. So that is one. And uh, it should be, and there should be no contamination. Uh, it should have a proper composition and no gas loss. So these are the requirements for metal powders and there are different powder processing routes. Here we can see that uh, in the first one, this is gas atomized powder, uh, this is centrifugally uh, produced powder and this is uh, rota rotating electrode powder. So different processes of uh, powder processing have different uh, advantages and disadvantages. Uh, but I would like to mention one thing that uh, the rotor uh, prep process, that is plasma rotating electrode process, uh, is basically used for very high melting temperature materials, for example, titanium and tungsten and all those things. And nowadays, gas automation can also be done by uh, for titanium alloys, but uh, that requires a very careful processing. So what you can uh, see here is the next slide. Uh, in the left uh, slide, you can see this is the powder producing unit where you have induction melting furnace, you have, you have a nozzle here that is called atomizer. And once the atomizer interacts with the liquid, then you get fine droplets and these droplets allowed to solidify, they give rise to powders. Uh, these powders may have very wide side range, 
Uh, so you have to uh, deal with the process parameters, means what kind of gas pressure you are using, what kind of nozzle you are using, and uh, what kind of liquid temperature you are using, all those things, what is the surface tension on the material, whether the, your gas is hot or cold, all those things parameters determine the size and distribution of a pond. The second uh, route, uh, what uh, is given here in the right, is for very high melting temperature materials, what you can do is uh, there is an induction coil here. So, no, uh, this is a rod, induction coil, no contact with any material. And once this is melted, directly coming to the zone of atomization, and you have gases coming. Okay. So, uh, this is the other process of uh, powder. Um, <coughs> and this is you are using uh, bias of uh, some materials. And here you are generating a plasma torch, and this plasma torch, due to very high energy transfer, you get a spray of droplets, and you can get fine powder. Thing. So there are different ways of uh, making gas atomization uh, powders, atomized powders, but uh, there are different uh, nozzle design. The earlier what I showed is uh, free fall atomization nozzle design, and now this is the uh, Close coupled gas atomization uh, nozzle where the liquid comes here and immediately after it interacts with the gas. That means the liquid and gas, if they are left open, left free, they will interact here. But in close coupled atomization, it interacts here. So it uses full uh, high velocity gas uh, jet energy and efficiency of atomization in this case is very high. So this gives rise to a very fine powder, uh, powder and also uh, you uh, get, get, get very good, uh, very uh, low, a very narrow uh, side distribution in this. And uh, these are just to show that what is the market demand uh, of these powders. Market demand of these powders have uh, been years. So this is not very important, but it just show that the demand is increasing due to the application in AM. And the second thing is, here again, you can see 3D printing meters market uh, from 17 to 25. This is just a prediction. And uh, here also you can see the demand for powders increases. So powder is the most important raw material for additive manufacturing. And and we have to concentrate on this. Somehow, the raw materials are costly, making the additively manufactured component uh, costly. I have, I have known some people uh, who uh, uh, started up some work and they bought some machines, but seeing the cost and the demand, they uh, uh, stopped uh, those startups. So that should not happen. And this is, uh, as I told you, for high temperature materials, uh, these are the this is the process that is prepped where you have uh, uh, this is the material to be atomized, and this is electrode, and this there is plasma, and this plasma uh, melts the material here, and as there is a high speed motor running at around 10,000 rpm, then this liquid form here, and uh, they are uh, set, uh, they are ejected out due to Centrifugal forces, and by the time they reach uh, up to this point, they are solidified. And this uh, solidified droplets and the particles are collected in the chamber. Uh, uh, this process is mostly done in uh, uh, closed inert uh, atmosphere like argon or helium. And uh, now, the properties of AM parts uh, this just show that the AM parts are. Uh, good uh, compared to the conventionally designed parts, con con conventionally manufactured parts, or they may be uh, better than that. And uh, in this one slide, uh, I will tell you that not only additive manufacturing, but there is a new term coming up the meta market manufacturing. So, using the uh, cyberspace as well as the uh, tool-less manufacturing, what is happening is now people have uh, started 
passing the CNC additive, they are voting, going to metamorphic manufacturing, and that is totally robotic black smithing. So, it just uh, uh, just to uh, let you know the term that what is going on uh, worldwide. So here you can see that everything is being done by robot, one single person controlling every aspect of manufacturing. So this is called uh, metamorphic manufacturing, and this person can also be shifted if somewhere else if there is cyber space coming in the picture. So recently, uh, we had uh, last year one Indo-German uh, workshop on additive manufacturing where uh, 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 10 to 12 people came from Germany, experts in additive manufacturing, and we have uh, many experts from India also. So I would like to uh, bring in here the recommendations made by them. It is just one year old, so I hope these recommendations still hold for the country. and. Uh, uh, these are uh, they are like this. Uh, <clears throat> the first is manufacturing of suitable and affordable powders for AM need to be prioritized. Alternative route for powder production should also be explored. Then uh, scientific understanding of metallurgy involved in AM, for example, microstructure evolution, solidification phenomena should be developed through experimentation and modeling and simulation, particularly the non-equilibrium kinetics and metastability. Then uh, prediction tools for new material composition suitable for AM processing should be developed for utilizing the technology with better acceptability. A platform is desired for big data accumulation from many machines and materials so as to make way for mass production. And uh, next one is effective online control and monitoring of processes is required for producing reproducible and defect-free components. More emphasis needs to be given on sensing the thermal parameters during uh, product development or during building the product. Uh, this is very important that a large pool of people should be educated on AM because if this process has to uh, be used widespread uh, throughout the world, then we have to have a pool of uh, skillful people, skilled people in this. And therefore, uh, AM uh, needs to be brought to people uh, and people should be educated so as to ensure availability of skilled men for in future. Then lack of company uh, last year, so it was being discussed that lack of standards for materials, processes, and components made by AM should be prioritized to bring in more number of players in this technology. Otherwise, what is happening? Uh, one company makes something and it, it is the property of or the knowledge of that that uh, company itself. Nobody else can make it. So standard, standardization has to be a, a priority area in AM. And for widespread technological breakthroughs and implementation, softwares can be made available on a cloud. And the last one is, the best use of the technology can be made by identifying application-driven goals, development, and deployment. Uh, with this, uh, I end uh, this presentation. I think uh, this is good enough uh, for the audience and for the students. And I thank you all. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you very much for this wonderful presentation. You provided a lot of insights into various aspects of additive manufacturing, be it uh, the process itself, the raw materials, design. So it was a great session. So we are now open to question and answers to and a session. The students can type the questions in the chat box or they can ask but with a couple of questions. Sir, if we talk about uh, uh, the college level uh, 
uh, 3D printers, the basically which are largely polymer based, like provided by Flash Forge or MakerBot, like that. Yeah. So uh, I believe all these uh, portable printers, polymer based, yeah. uh, they are uh, essentially uh, based on extrusion technology. If I am right. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Uh, they have they have a, a different wires. Uh, these wires go through a nozzle. Uh, it is heated in that nozzle, and the temperature of that nozzle may vary from different manufacturers. And uh, accordingly, uh, it is printed. And they are based on uh, PLA and some polymer is there. Yeah. Okay, sir, you can. Stop your screen sharing. Oh, it is still there? Yeah. Oh, okay. okay. Thank you. It's fine. Okay, so second question is, uh, yeah. uh, for example, if we talk about uh, any of the uh, technologies, maybe it's CNC machining or like X-ray treatment, uh -huh. medical imaging, spectroscopy uh, so unfortunately uh, india has been importing uh, the technological know how or the equipment even for defense and aerospace as well uh, we yeah. are largely importing yeah but uh, as you mentioned some points in your presentation regarding uh, the manufacturing of metal powders and uh, regarding the standards as well yeah. So where you should, where you you view India, uh, in terms of the additive manufacturing ecosystem, in terms of uh, technology and science. Uh, yeah. and this is a very difficult question for me, but uh, even then, <laughs> uh, I will, you see, uh, there are some uh, uh, one CSIR lab, in CMERI, as well as RRCAT. Uh, they have some uh, very basic uh, system and, uh, and the acceptability of this uh, uh, process in India uh, seems to be not very good. Though we are learning and I think uh, we will learn and recent uh, emphasis uh, of the government of uh, art and labor, it is going to uh, aid to this uh, depletion. And so far as powder is concerned, uh, we at NML are going to establish one uh, powder manufacturing system. We are buying it. Uh, it will be at NML. And uh, we surely will have uh, uh, the flexibility of designing the alloy system, making the powder, testing at uh, uh, a given uh, AM machine, and seeing the possibility of performance of uh, 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 so far as the uh, Indian ecosystem for AM is concerned, uh, I think people are trying, people are very much uh, trying to learn even now, trying to learn even now that what kind, uh, how to go, be, uh, go about it. Uh, but uh, uh, we should be ready with the knowledge, knowledge uh, generated uh, in the world or in India. Uh, on AIM. Uh, any other question coming up? Yes, yeah, students, do, do, do you have any questions? Abhishek, do you have any question? Ankita, about the implants, if you want to ask something. So there is one question from a student, Prince Mishra. Do you think AM will ever be able to produce large structures such as an aircraft wing? If so, what is needed to make this happen? Okay. You see, aircraft wings, uh, first of all, uh, nowadays we are going for aluminum lithium alloys for the, these materials. And uh, making powders of aluminum lithium alloy is not uh, that easy. Uh, and, uh, so far as uh, uh, material is concerned, if we don't uh, talk about the material, what material is being uh, is to be used, uh, then definitely uh, 
for example we had been uh, seeing the youtube and uh, other uh, internet uh, website uh, they show that there are uh, different uh, uh, buildings there for making and other thing but so for metal powders is concerned and metallic structures are concerned uh, we have to uh, have big uh, machines also so big machines if uh, people are able to make and what is the requirement because it all depends on the market and uh, market and nation market people develop the uh, tools so if we uh, we are sure that uh, uh, these uh, are required these wings are required to be made by am and there are benefits then definitely it can go but economic side to be taken care of any other question abhishek do you have a question uh, hello ankita yeah hello good morning sir uh, this is abhishek uh, from mechanical department and yeah, uh, sir i have one question ki uh, sir what will be the effect of porosity in binder jetting process uh, as a green part is already uh, weak so uh, uh, how how we will enhance the strength of uh, the part yeah and just uh, let me explain it to you because it so happened that uh, layer by what it does is binds the different particles of the powder okay yes and that and that is say there is no porosity we call it a green compact a green uh, build okay so it will not have strength if you want it to be uh, uh, to have a strength then you have to go for sintering of this material and during sintering what happens uh, the binder get evaporated and these particles come together okay and uh, diffusion starts taking place between two particles and once diffusion starts these two particles bind so once uh, all the particles bind together Uh, and this is as good as a monolithic material, so then you get the strength. So after binder jetting, you have to go for uh, sintering process. Okay. Sintering is mandatory process for uh, binder jetting. Yeah, process. yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you, sir. Good morning, sir. Ankita, this side from ILM College. Good morning, sir. I have a question. How metal additive manufacturing improves common type of uh, medical implants? mainly orthopedic sir hello sir am i audible hello. sir am i audible yeah now audible go ahead please sir can i uh, again state my question hello yeah please go ahead sir my question is how metal additive manufacturing improves common type of medical implants as i cobalt chromium alloys and we get the powders of these alloys by implants so this is what you wanted the answer for uh yes sir yes sir yeah yeah sir i think the okay yeah yeah so uh, did you get the complete answer ankita yes sir uh, actually because i couldn't hear some yeah. some portion some portion is missed out because of uh, statics but uh, still I yeah sir can you repeat the answer some portion was missed out uh, are one of the most uh, biocompatible material uh, and uh, cobalt chromium is one of them we also one of them so these materials are used for uh, bio implants and we uh, bio plants are made by getting powders of these materials and in making uh, uh, additive manufacturing and one thing very important is 
just for example, our bones. Bones have uh, porosity as well. Okay. So if you know the structure of bones, then you can uh, print the uh, implants uh, solid as well as porous part together. So this is the biggest advantage. And it is very difficult to make such parts uh, by other, other processes. So the SLM process is being used for making uh, um, orthopedic implants for a very long time. Thank yeah, you, sir. Uh, am I clear? Yeah. Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir, for this clarity. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Okay. Yeah. So, any other questions? Any other questions? Uh, sir, uh, I have one just, uh, I want some information. For example, for uh, BTEC students, yeah. What is the procedure adopted by CSIR labs, either as a common procedure or as an individual lab, uh, mm. for a summer internship of uh, BTEC students? Yeah, summer internship, I think. Uh, in animal, uh, the advertisements mostly come in February or March. And then we uh, uh, put the notice, put a notice board that who are the students selected uh, for internship, and they generally come here uh, in NML from May uh, 10th to around July 15th or 20th like that. So we take around uh, 50 to 60 students by year for summer internship. Okay, so there is a basically separate advertisement by yeah, NML. Yeah, yeah, advertisement is there on our website, generally. Okay, on your website, okay, okay. And also, do you have any, any uh, short-term schemes for uh, faculty members as well, like uh, during, again, maybe during summer vacation uh, or some winter vacation, the faculty member is willing to do some uh, some short term project maybe one month or so uh, is there any proper channel for that or that is just i mean case to case basis something like that uh, it's, uh, i think it's case to case basis and uh, uh, head of the institute has to uh, agree to that and there is a possibility there are in the possibility that uh, this can be done uh, but it's case okay, case. there is no uh, no such uh, running uh, process already in uh, animal. Okay, sir, I understand. Yeah. yeah. Okay, I think there are no more questions. Then, so uh, question? uh, are there any? So this is the final call for questions. If there are any, you can ask. Otherwise, uh, we. Uh, Okay, sir, I think there are no, no more questions. So uh, thank you, sir, uh, for this wonderful session. Welcome, welcome. Uh, and uh, yeah, as we had uh, certain things were discussed in the, some of the previous lectures, for example, the mold and core printing, it was yeah. uh, discussed uh, in a lecture by Voxel Jet India. Voxel Jet. So they make, uh, yeah industry grade printers and i think uh, i could infer from their presentation that uh, that is their specialty that they can make uh, mold and core uh, additive manufactured components for for further uh, castings yeah, sure. yeah yeah and also the students had exposure to some of the conventional manufacturing methods also uh, so okay. uh, it is important uh, for a student or faculty member that uh, first of all a good understanding of the conventional manufacturing processes yeah uh, what are the properties we get from those processes what are the materials yeah, sure, sure, sure. Uh, can be manufactured uh, then sure. actually uh, then uh, so uh, additive manufacturing is then one step ahead actually so yeah, yeah. after having it yeah, thorough knowledge of conventional manufacturing, then uh, anyone will be able to compare in, in more detail uh, that uh, what he is basically making out of uh, out of additive manufacturing. Yeah. Uh, 
uh, yeah so thank you sir uh, thank you very much uh, and uh, uh, yeah so we are just now winding up this session the students can join at 12 o'clock for the second part thank you sir uh, thank you very much i send my best wishes to all of you thank you thank you sir